Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a brilliant little lyric poem. In fact, some have called it one of the greatest short lyric poems in all of Leaves of Grass, Sparkle from the, Sparkles from the Wheel. This is poem number 22 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets. We've commented in earlier lectures, Autumn representing that which is old, Rivulets that which is new. And we're certainly going to see that played out in this poem. It's quite a remarkable little poem. I love to read it out loud. It's a lot of fun to read with children for reasons that will become self-evident here as we get into it. Now our assumptions that you've been with us throughout our study here, LearnStrong.net, down the left-hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, and that you've been with us from the very beginning through the inscriptions, poems. For example, I hear America singing. We're going to get some imagery from that poem that will remind us in this poem, up through and including a set of introductory comments on uh, Autumn Rivulets. I'm hopeful that you've uh, messed around with that. And then uh, we just finished with Miracles. Now, we always refer to our Nortons to get us some background information. And on this one, we're told that it first appeared with the present title and text in a Leaves of Grass group of 1871, Passage to India. We have lots of trial lines um, and in, in other, in other uh, journals and the like. Um, older readers, the Nortons will say, will remember the fascination of city children by the itinerant knife grinder and his treadle wheel. The poem illustrates Whitman's brilliant power to create a vignette of such scenes in which, however, the point of view is not entirely objective. The poet, an arrested phantom, bringing in himself as observer, conscious perhaps of himself as being also a maker of sparkles from the wheel. And then Nortons will suggest that we compare this with some of the qualities in Robert Frost's The Grindstone, a brilliant poem as well. Now, here we've got what is often referred to as a picture poem. And we've seen this a few times in Lisa Grass, where Whitman is just describing something that he's looking at. Um, a picture, we might say, of 19th century American street life, where, for example, you could see someone that would be, you know, um, sharpening uh, the, the, the knife edge with the wheel. Um, and in some ways, many have argued, this is a poem that kind of anticipates or prepares us for the images poetry of the 20th century. We're going to finish, of course, with Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot comes to mind. Now, think about the power of the word sparkles. We saw it already in Song of Myself 49, Sparkles of Day. And think about the power of wheel as it has been used already in Leaves of Grass. You'll remember this in Song of Myself 48. There's no object so soft, but it becomes a hub for the wheeled universe. So the idea of the spinning wheel will obviously be symbolic as well. Let's just enjoy the poem and the rhythms of the poem. Where the city's ceaseless crowd moves on the live long day, withdrawn, I join a group of children watching. I pause aside with them. By the curb toward the edge of the flagging, a knife grinder works at his wheel, sharpening a great knife. Bending over, he carefully holds it to the stone by foot and knee. With measured tread, he turns rapidly as he presses with light but firm hand. Fourth issue then in copious golden jets, sparkles from the wheel. The scene and all its belongings, how they seize and affect me. The sad, sharp-chinned old man with worn clothes and broad shoulder band of leather. Myself effusing and fluid, a phantom curiously floating, now here absorbed and arrested. The group, an unminded point set in a vast surrounding. The attentive, quiet children, the loud, proud, restive base of the streets. The low horse purr of the whirling stone, the light-pressed blade, diffusing, dropping, sideways darting in tiny showers of gold, sparkles from the wheel. Now this poem, brilliant in its construction, notice that we are, we are going to see a unity here, a definite beginning, a middle, and an end, which makes this poem fun to read as well. Notice, we'll begin with setting, where the cities, notice all the sea sounds, where the city ceaseless crowd moves on the live long day. Again, this idea of movement from autumn rivulets, the idea of a river. Withdrawn is an interesting word. In other words, I was kind of floating down the street and all of a sudden I withdraw here, I come to the side. I join a group of children watching. I don't think it's insignificant that it's children who are watching this performance. This takes us back, of course, to Plato's Republic and to Book 7. You'll remember in the cave allegory, it is a child who will be emancipated, right? Plato's pedagogy, as we talked about it in, in earlier lectures, especially when we were messing around with Song of Myself, passage 46 and 47. 
Notice, I pause aside with them. So in other words, Whitman, and this is one of the things I love about Whitman, is his childlike tendencies. In other words, if a child can be interested in it, I can be interested in it. Like, he's walking along, all of a sudden he sees a bunch of children, and he's like, what are they looking at? And he goes over, and he joins them. Now, to the description of what is being shown here, what is being seen. By the curb, toward the edge of the flagging, a knife grinder taking us back to an older view already in Whitman's day. This kind of technology was already beginning to be replaced, and in that regards, the knife grinder is overrelated to the autumn of autumn rivulets. Works at his wheel, sharpening a great knife. Now, there's, of course, immediately a figurative reading of this poem that has to do with poetic artistic inspiration and the way in which it takes a spinning wheel to create a great knife that which can cut, that which can sever, that which can create a knife, right? Bending over, he, notice the, the, the language, it's brilliant, carefully holds it to the stone by foot and knee, amazing eye. Obviously, Whitman has seen this many times. With measured tread, it's always fun, anytime Whitman uses the word measured, right, to go back to 46, A Song of Myself, um, I know I have the best of time and space, it was never measured, it never will be measured, but you notice here, it's, a measured tread, he turns rapidly as he presses with light but firm hand. That two sides of the yin-yang symbol, right? The light and the firm hand. Fourth issue then in copious golden jets. We're going to come to this obviously at the end of the poem. Sparkles from the wheel. Now I think that this, uh, this idea of the sparkles uh, kind of being sent out that Whitman learned from his study of Shelley's uh, Ode to the West Wind, especially Passage 5, when Shelley says, I want to send these sparks out into the universe if winter comes, can spring be far behind, is the optimistic message that is to be shared. And of course, we've given full lectures on Ode to the West Wind at LearnStrong.net if you want to run into ground. Sparkles from the wheel. By the way, uh, we're going to see this word sparkles one other time here in the Sleepers Part 2. The sparkles of starshine is the way it's going to get used there in that brilliant poem. And then, all of a sudden, Whitman has this amazing capacity to tell us what he's seeing and then to begin to kind of move, like a phantom here in a second he'll call it, move back away. And it's almost as if photography is playing a role here in the way that Whitman is describing what he's seeing. The scene and all its belongings how they seize and affect me. Now, this idea of being seized, grab hold, I told you guys this is one of the central motifs of Lisa Grass, hugging, grabbing, seizing, wrestling. Then he turns to the man who is sharpening, and he calls him sad. Now, why he calls him sad is never made clear here. Maybe it's because this is representative of the old, that he knows that this technology is soon going to be replaced, and he himself the sad, sharp-chinned old man, again back to autumn for autumn rivulets, with worn clothes and broad shoulder band of leather. So you've got the man working, the old man working. Myself, and now all of a sudden, interestingly, effusing and fluid. In other words, there's an identification here for Whitman as poet, we might say. Effusing and fluid, and we're back to rivers again, rivulets. A phantom curiously floating, and again, this word curiously, it's one that we just keep coming back to from Song of Myself 4 and on. I mean, this idea that he's constantly looking, he's constantly curious. If there's one thing we learn from our study of Leaves of Grass, it is that a capacity, that artistic wonder and awe that's always going to be a part of Whitman's project. We call it, of course, lifelong learning. Tennyson will call it in Ulysses to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bounds of human thought. Notice here, a phantom curiously floating now here, absorbed and arrested of... of uh, before, you know, as, as he was commenting on this, he, he would comment on how he's ready to turn aside and it's going to seize and affect him. Now, it's absorbed and arrested. Uh, and by arrested here, he's like engrossed. In other words, he's watching this happen and he's standing there with the children and he's looking at the children and he's looking at the old man and there's all kinds of connections that he's making. Notice the group. And then in parenthetics, to remind us of our, of our Emily Dickinson with these asides, an unminded point set in a vast surrounding. In other words, he's, a, he's and this takes us back to Brooklyn Ferry, no question. He's playing that game of where I am right now, but I, I'm, I'm aware, I'm present in this moment that there's all this of the city that's around me. And so as he begins to kind of telescope up and away, again, the phantom floating, the attentive, quiet children, they're watching, they're mesmerized. The loud, 
as opposed to quiet, right? The loud, proud, restive base of the streets. In other words, there's all... In, in other words, life goes on. The city goes on as these children are kind of mesmerized by this moment. The low, hoarse purr of the whirling stone. The use of the word purr happens one time in all leaves of grass. It's right here. I find that fascinating. Horse is an interesting, low horse. And if you've ever been uh, able to see this, the, the use of a grindstone to sharpen a blade, it, it does have that horse kind of sound to it. The whirling stone... The light pressed blade, because there's a there's an artistic technology here, right? I mean, you can't just hold that blade against that; you'll just you'll kill the you'll kill the blade off. It's this it's this dance between the hard stone and the movement with with the blade. And then notice your D sounds: diffusing, dropping, sideways, darting, taking us back to miracles. The poem with the use of the word dart in tiny showers of gold sparkles from the wheel. They, of course, sparkles are technically coming from the dance between the metal uh, and the blade and the wheel. But notice they're spinning off these tiny bits of gold, like stars, right? The imagery is beautiful. Well, what are we going to say about this at 2A? I, I think Whitman is making an observation about artistic inspiration. That it is a miracle, just like he was referencing in his prior poem, these sparkles. But more importantly, the audience, these children, are in awe of this artistic product, this artistic moment. And in the same way, these sparkles, they create a certain kind of inspiration for anyone who is curious enough, back to the, the word, the curious, curious enough to pay attention. At Tubi, I love the balance of the lines. I love the language itself. I love to read this poem. I love the fact that we have an introduction. We have a body and we have a conclusion. It's quite a brilliant little poem. The rhythms are, are, are in some ways like that horse and spinning, whirring, purring kind of stone. I love, I love all of that. At 3A, we mentioned the Imagist poets, and I think that Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot were both very influenced by a poem like this. Go back to our comments on Pound's Metro as well as T.S. Eliot's Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. I think that there's a lot that those two poets learn from a poem like this, along with, of course, Carlos Williams and any number of others of the great Imagist poetry, uh, poets, along with, obviously, their study of Dickinson. Finally, at 3B, how are we going to own a poem like this? Well, I, I think I can ask maybe a couple of questions that can help you guys think about this poem. Where do you think artistic inspiration comes from? Notice the dance between, on the one hand, the wheel, which has to be turning. And, of course, we think of the wheel of the world. We think of history and all of that. And then, of course, you have to hold the blade, but you can't hold it too harshly or too close. And out of that dance comes this creation of these sparks. And from those sparks, obviously... All kinds of new inspiration is found. How do you understand that game? And uh, when was the last time that you enjoyed watching artistic expression? I'm, I'm hopeful that it's happening as you're picking up all these poems of Lisa Grass to read. Thank you.